This is one of those videos that I have thought about making for a while, but then uh, tech leader Patrick made his video about how um, his wife left him and I didn't want to make it because it didn't seem appropriate. This happened long ago and I don't want it to seem like I'm trying to ride the coattails of your video, Patrick. This happened like years ago, um, but this is for you. I know it sucks. I've been there. I'm with you, bro. But it's probably a lot harder for you because you uh, had a kid. Uh, this video has nothing to do with code. This video has nothing to do with motivation, really. It might not be your cup of tea. And um, I know that my ex-wife's mom watches these videos. So, kiddos, kaikista. Um, you'll always be my Finnish mom. If you've been watching my channel, you might have seen a live stream where I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want to get married. Been there done that and they're like wait what you were married how old were you I was young and dumb that's how old I was I'm 29 years old right now I got married when I was 20 and then I got divorced when I was 24 right around 18 19 years old I was in school for mechanical engineering in Atlanta Georgia and then I met a girl online Finnish girl and we talked for a few years it went back and forth I was a lot younger than her dropped the L word a few times you know talk like all day every day I was super enamored I guess what's the word like the honeymoon phase you know and it was the same on her end because a new culture for me new culture for her after a few years I was like you know what um, you know if I ever come out there I'll take you on a date like wink you know it was like kind of obvious that if we could date we would probably date so I I bought a plane ticket to go to Finland with my student loans, being the smart 19, 20 year old that I was. And a few weeks before I take the trip to go to Finland, she emails me and says that, uh, hey, I'm really excited for you to come, but I've met someone else. And I was like, wait, what? Really? Like, um, and to be honest, I was pretty pissed off. I wasn't expecting to go there and like marry her right away or anything. I was, you know, I was pretty, pretty mad. And I tried to refund my ticket, but it was too close to the departure date, so I couldn't. And I got there, and I was staying at her place, which seemed kind of odd because she had met someone, right? And uh, after a few days, we ended up like making out in the kitchen, and we kind of hit it off. And me being this guy back then, I thought I had won her over, you know? Um, super cringe to think about. You know, I thought that I was better than the other guy because I got her to like like me more than the other dude and at the end of the trip she like called up the dude and was like it's not gonna work out anymore and they, oh man it makes me cringe real hard to think about that now you know like I was this white knight basically in shining armor that thought I had saved her from this other guy that wouldn't commit he didn't want to have labels and you know I was like I'll commit I'll be there for you like if big cringe so after the trip from Finland. I came back to the US and she came to visit me for a few weeks for Christmas, but that was really it. And we kept trying to figure out how we we're going to see each other, how we we're going to make this work, you know, because long distance sucks if you've ever done it, which well, I, I wouldn't recommend it. And um, we decided, you know what, we're probably, we're probably just going to end up getting married anyways. We've been talking for so long. We've been talking for years and things are going so great. Like, might as well just go ahead and get married, right? This sounds like from your end, you're like, well, there's a problem right there, Josh. Like, but when you're in it, you know, you're just blinded by it and there's nothing that anyone can say to tell you otherwise. And everyone's trying to be supportive, but at the, the same time, they're like, Josh, what are you doing? And I'm sure they were saying the same thing to her. I tried to bring her to the United States and like, you can't really do that when you're a broke college kid. You have to get a fiance visa and you have to get a sponsor and that costs a lot of money. And then she has to go back and wait for the visa to be processed before she can actually come back and live here with the green card. So I decided, you know what, I'll just go to Finland. So I looked up a bunch of schools in Finland and they had a mechanical engineering degree there. I was like, cool, so if we get married, I can move there and I can re-enroll back into school and just keep on going and now we can be together and live our lives and it'll be great. That's what we did, I got all the paperwork, I bought another ticket with my student loans and then I told my parents, I was like, hey, I'm uh, getting married and I'm going to Finland. And that's what I did. I took one checked bag, went to the airport, got on an airplane and, and moved there. When I got there, I didn't really know any Finnish at all. I moved in with her at her place, and then we went to the courthouse, and we got married in a little Finnish court, and her like mom and dad were there. While I was there for a few months waiting for the visa to process, because you're allowed to be in Finland while you're technically not like 
you don't have like a resident permit or anything you're just waiting for the residence permit to process i was just there i was just kind of in limbo didn't really know any finnish didn't really have anybody to go meet and if you've never been to finland or any of the nordic countries you'll know that it's really difficult to meet people when i got the visa i applied to a school in finland on the russian border and i went there to take an entrance exam and i thought it was kind of funny that they wouldn't let me just transfer in being that i had already been in college for a few years and they said no you can't transfer in sorry we don't care about your previous experience everyone takes the entrance exam no degree no free pass and i take the test and the test has like calculus three on it physics three on it this really difficult chemistry on it wait what holy crap there's like 17 year olds taking this and they're finishing it way faster than me the school was free it had 25 slots for the degree program that i wanted to do it was in english and there was like a thousands of people that have applied for it. A few months later, I got the results of the entrance exam. I had just been playing a bunch of video games and doing nothing, and the relationship between me and the ex-wife, it was okay, right? Still in the honeymoon stages. It was it was whatever. She would get pissed off that I didn't want to come to bed at the same time as her, whatever, which I thought was kind of weird, but the results said, no, sorry, you didn't get in, but you've been placed on a waiting list. You're number nine on the list to get into this engineering school, and I was like, well, who's going to give up why would nine people give up a free bachelor's in mechanical engineering? That just seems really dumb. That wasn't part of the plan. I didn't really have a plan B. I get another email one day when I'm getting my hair cut. Hey, congratulations, you've been accepted. And I was like, wait, what? Holy crap. And so we pack up our stuff and we move to the Russian border and I start going to school there. By this point in time, kind of like the, the honeymoon phase has kind of worn off and I'm starting to have like this culture shock and uh, I'm wanting to do things that I want to do. I'm wanting to just talk to people like I'm used to talking to people. I want to just kind of eat the foods that I'm used to eating. And I just kind of want to go back to, you know, how how I'm used to doing things. And I can't do that anymore. And I'm sure that was stressful for her. And it was kind of stressful for me. I have to go to school at the same time. And she's working. And uh, she was a hair hairdresser, cosmetologist, I guess. It was a pretty interesting experience because I started failing the courses right off the bat in Finland. I started failing the math classes because the teacher would come in, write stuff on the board, and just walk out. If you've never been to Finland, Finnish people are very blunt. They'll just tell you what they're thinking no matter what. There's no small talk. They just tell it to you how it is. And if you're from the South, like me, where everyone's like, oh, bless your heart, instead of saying, boy, are you dumb? They just beat around the bush with everything here in the United States. Everyone has to sweet talk it or kind of just say it without saying it because they don't want to offend you. In Finland, people don't care. They just tell it to you how it is. And that that's really jarring at first. But now I would say that's kind of like a big reason for uh, why I am the way that I am now these days because I, I can appreciate that. Thank you for being honest instead of just pretending like everything's gonna be okay. I remember specifically because I went to ask the math teacher for help one day and she said, okay, Josh, let's look at it. What do you think happens here? And I'm like, I, I don't know. And she looks at me dead, dead ass in the eyes. And she's like, are you dumb? I remember like, can you say that to me as a teacher? Just taken back and I was like, I guess so. I guess, I guess I am because I, I don't know how to do it. You know, that was the point where I was like, well, this is just gonna how this is, this is how it is here, I guess. During school, between the stress of trying to pass classes and her kind of adapting to living with me and um, her working and trying to figure out what it's like to live with someone that you've never really lived with more than like three weeks, things started to get stressful and you start to realize that you didn't know the person um, that you that you thought you did. Things started to kind of just go downhill. I never claimed to be like a, like a perfect husband or like that I didn't do anything wrong, but I will say that like I was always supportive and I was always trying to, you know, be as logical as possible. And I know everyone in the comments is like, well, there's your first problem right there, Josh. And I'm like, you're talking, you're telling me now, right? But I think I was a pretty decent husband, but I think the stress on her end of um, maybe being the provider role was kind of too much. And I think over time she kind of started to resent me 
for that because I would go to school full time and she would work and I would say things like, hey, look, man, it's just, it's just your turn right now. You, I know you got to work, but when I when I graduate and I get this degree, I can start making money and I can I can pamper you a little, a little bit, you know, and I can I can do all the things that you want to do that you're having to put on hold because you have to deal with me. And I didn't understand at the time, like I didn't think that was like really right for me to have to kind of say that stuff. I was like, this was all part of it. You know, you're already doing what you want to do full time. I just you just got to wait for me to catch up for a minute. And uh, she would say things to me over the course of these few years that I think almost could be qualified as like emotional abuse. This is not a fun topic to talk about, but a few notable phrases that I remember her saying to me very bluntly um, was, why are you so dumb? I feel like I'm in jail being married to you. I wish we never got married. Um, You might have to work at Walmart because your degree won't be worth anything. Um, you aren't man enough. Um, I remember one time she said to me, like, you're a sex addict. And I was like, we mumbo like once every other month. What are you talking about? Um, and then also being from, um, the United States where males are typically circumcised at birth, um, in Europe, they don't do that, and she would um, make remarks about that too, right? It looks like it's broken. Why is it so weird? You know, I can't deal with this. Just, I'm not really sure why it started to, to ramp up like that. It went zero to 100 real quick, I know, right? Like, if you're watching this video, I can forgive you for saying those things, but I'll never forget because th- those were really, I guess they're just kind of like hurtful things to say to somebody, um, and you're not sure why you're being told this stuff. I would try to like, you know, calm her down and relax and be like, look, man, I know that you have to pay all the bills and stuff right now. And I know it's stressful that I'm in school full time and that you're working full time and we don't have the time and the money to do the things that we want to do. Um, but you shouldn't talk to me like this. And I'm not sure why you're saying these things to, to begin with. Um, but, you know, just give me my, my time. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And even though I was like failing at the time, trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong with school and stuff. When you go to tell people, about these things, like these remarks that you're, you know, getting told, a lot of people are just like, hey, yo, man up, Josh, or it's not that big of a deal, or, you know, you know, grow up, or, you know, grow a pair, stuff like that. Um, but I never really engaged with the arguing because I prefer to be kind of level-headed and just talk about things, you know, I don't, I don't make rash decisions when I'm angry, I don't make decisions when I'm sad, I don't make decisions when I'm happy. I just talk about things and try to think things out the best I can. And so whenever these huge emotional, I guess, arguments would come up, um, she would never really get a response out of me because I would just kind of be like, are you done? (laughs) Do you feel better now, you know? I think because I didn't give a reaction, I amplified her end of things. So throughout the course of school, as this relationship kind of devolved, we kind of grew apart, right? Um, I would try to do things around the house. I would try to like spend time with her, but like, Things just weren't the same anymore. Um, you know, I try to cook food, give her foot rub, whatever. I, I think I was a pretty decent husband in that regard. Um, but when there wasn't anything to do, I would just play video games. And for whatever reason, she just hated video games. And I would try to explain to her, I was like, it's really cold outside. I don't really have any friends right now. We don't have any money and this is free. So this is what I'm going to be doing. In hindsight, right, I'd go back in time and slap myself and like learn code or something. But at the time, it seemed, it seemed fine because there was a lot of stress and you don't want to deal with it. Throughout the course of school, I started to find these books with the finished word uh, divorce labeled on them. I was like, wait, what is this? I didn't know quite enough Finnish to be able to decipher what it all said, so I'd take pictures and send them to my Finnish friends that I had at school. I just had like two. And then one day I came home from school and I was at my computer doing some homework, and I, th- I think, and she came and slapped a piece of paper down on the desk that said, sign it. And I was like, what is this? She says, you know what's going to happen anyway. And I said, what are you talking about? And she's like, this is a paper for divorce. I kind of, I refuse to sign. I said, get this paper, get this paper out of my face. Like we can go to couples counseling. We can work it out. I'm not sure really what these issues are for these past few years, but you've never really wanted to address it or talk about it. And when I signed up to be a husband, when I said, I do, you know, through thick and thin, right? Rich or poor, whatever. Like, that's what I signed up to do. And and to be honest, I was kind of like, I was crying at this point in time. And um, she was laughing, saying like, we can still be friends. And I remember saying, I will not be friend zoned by my wife. And I like went like this and I kind of like slammed it down on the table, like looking at her. And I think that was like the first time in like, that I had 
ever kind of like raised my voice more than just what you hear right now. And um, she was laughing and said, Shh, the neighbors are gonna think we're fighting. And I was like, you know, just kind of like in tears, just like shaking here. Like all this is just going down the drain thinking about the ramifications of being divorced and alone in Finland with school still left to do. Um, so she put a pin kind of in my hand. It was, my hand was shaking. She put the pin in my hand and I just kind of signed it and I just kind of pushed it off my desk. But I just was like really confused and upset. So I started asking, I was like, why all of a sudden? What, what made you come to this conclusion? Why are we doing this? And she would only say, we are different people. As I said earlier in the video, I think it was because uh, it was my lack of self-sufficiency, my lack of independence. She would get really frustrated with teaching me things that I didn't understand right away. Um, I tried to learn how to use the bank accounts. And she said, like, why are you so dumb? Why can't you understand Finnish? Like, aren't you learning that in school? And just let me do it, you know, it's fine, whatever. Just just let me do it. And, you know, I tried to become self-sufficient. I tried to do things myself, but like she wouldn't, she wouldn't help me do these things. And, and if she did take five minutes to try and help me do it, she'd get really frustrated when I didn't understand it. Or she wouldn't trust me to do things. Like, uh, I got my Finnish driver's license. She would be like, no, you can't, you can't drive in the snow today. It's too snowy and you don't have experience with that. Or like, okay, well, can you show me how to drive in the snow? Or, I can't, no, it's, it's, I don't want to do it. Like, uh, let's just, no, I don't want to. I basically had no financial control over anything in the relationship. Uh, even at school, most times I had to ask for lunch money. And it was pretty emasculating to be honest. Or she would be like, okay, Josh, I put money in for lunch today, and then I'm like supposed to be super thankful for it or something. I'd be like, well, thank, thank you so much for putting money in, into my account so I can swipe my card and, and get lunch today. I remember thinking like, my, I was like being treated like a kindergartner at the time, but what, what do you do, right? You don't have any control in the relationship. You just kind of do what you're told at the point. And I remember thinking this is not a husband and wife relationship at all. And she was probably thinking the same thing. She's probably like, this is your job to pay off for my stuff. You know, you're the man. And when you talk to people about this stuff, they just say like, man up, quit being a baby, you know, deal with it. Or, you know, it's your job, you know, figure it out, just suck it up. And I, I, I tried not to, man, but like, you know, it's difficult. Towards the end of the relationship, um, she left me in the apartment alone for weeks at a time, and she went to go uh, live with her parents. Occasionally, I would have to ask for money to be put into my account so that I could get lunch. And whenever I'd have to call her and be like, "Hey, can I have some money? I, I don't have any. I don't have any money to get lunch at school today. I don't have any money for groceries." She'd be like, "It's gone already. What did you spend it on?" And get super frustrated. And it got to the point where I just wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for money because I didn't want to have to beg like a child and get disciplined. I would get lunch at school because it was so cheap and you would get a plate and you go down the line and I remember I would always like pack the plate full of, of food. You know, I'd eat as much as possible on a Friday because I know on the weekend I didn't really have any food and I'd just suck it up and just have a couple days where you don't eat, you know? Because it was better than calling up and, and begging like a child for money. You know, I never, I never told anyone that. If you're watching this, I never told you that. If you're watching this, her mom, I never told you guys this. I just not ask. I ate ketchup a few times for dinner. That was neat. I also ate toothpaste a few times for dinner. That was neat. Um, her mom would help me with money sometimes when I, when I ran out of money and I was just there alone. But I never wanted to take advantage of that. So if you're watching this, like I know that you helped me with money. It was nice, but I shouldn't have to call my, my Finnish mother-in-law just so that I can eat lunch. I'm still to this day not really sure why she was so unhappy with me. There was a lot of gas lighting and there was a lot of mental mind games. And um, you know, if she had a valid reason that she could find to tell her friends and family, then she could um, basically divorce me right away. Because the paper that I signed previously uh, had a six month wait period where you're supposed to kind of like go into like deliberations or think about it. Like, is this really what you want to do? But if she had a valid reason, she could skip that six month period and just divorce me. So for example, uh, when she would just leave me alone at the apartment for uh, a couple months, she would hide candy around the house. And one time she left candy in the box where we had the condoms. I realized this was like an actual trick. If I took the candy, she would question why I was going into the box where we kept those while she wasn't there. Um, especially if I took the candy, didn't say anything. She would also say lots of things like, it's fine, you can do whatever you want while I'm not there. It's fine, just go ahead, do what you want. And you know, this is all just bait to get me to cheat so that she can escalate the six month 
waiting period and just divorce me. And when they divorce you, they take your visa. If I had called her up and been like, why did you put candy here? Like, this is just obvious bait for you to see if I'm going to the condom box while you are not here, to see if I'm using them, basically, or wondering why I'd even need to go there. Because I, I she has done things like this before, and I called her out on it, I was like, why are you doing this? And she would just laugh and be like, oh, ha, 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 ha. Like, it's not funny, like, I don't understand what these games are. Another time, she uh, went through my computer and read all of my Facebook messages to see if I was cheating. That's fine, right? I don't have anything to hide. I'm not dumb enough to cheat and give you an actual reason to tell your friends and family why you hate me all of a sudden. So when I got back from class one day, I found a little post-it note, like right, like this big, just kind of tucked into my monitor. And uh, she's crying hysterically on the bed. And I walk in and I take this little, this little note and I read it. It says, move to Norway or wherever and be with that hoe. I don't care. My elbow kind of bumped into the table and turn the monitors on. I noticed that my Facebook was on and all these messages were popped up at the bottom. And I thought that was kind of odd. She apparently had found a message that was like eight months old from a girl that I used to uh, date that's from Norway. I used to date her when I was like 16 though, you know, for just like two months and then she moved back to Norway because she was just an ex exchange student. And because Finland and Norway border at the north, she's like, how's Finland? And I was like, it's pretty great. And how's the relationship? And I'm like, it's not that great, we'll probably get divorced. So I turn around to the wife, uh, laying on the bed, hysterically crying. I said, do you think I'm cheating? She has a fiance and they're getting married. And this message is from months ago. Did you go through my stuff? And this is what I would like to call the, the, the trickle truth. And she said, no, it was just like that. And I said, I don't, I, don't, I don't keep my computer on. And she said, well, I turned it on and it just popped up. I was like, I don't really use Facebook on my computer, just on my phone. Well, I tried to log into mine and it just automatically logged into yours. I said, I don't have my information saved. You tried to guess my password? And she said, well, I was just trying to see if I could figure it out for fun and the messages popped up. These messages are months and months and months old. They wouldn't just pop up. You'd have to go into the message history, scroll through, click on them and get them to pop up that way. And she's like, okay, fine. I had to know, I thought you were cheating on me. You've been so quiet lately. And I'm like, you made me sign a divorce paper. I don't, I don't have much to say. I'm just trying to graduate and finish school and get a job and get out of your hair. We're technically still married on paper for the next six months, I'm not going to cheat on you or do anything. I'm still your husband. I'd still like to work it out, but there's really nothing else I can do. And again, she started laughing and said, it's not that bad. I just didn't know because things with us, you know, aren't going well, you know? So this was just all, again, just a big facade, I guess, to try and bait me into something. The main thing that mattered to me at this point in time was that I signed a divorce paper and I have six months left of a valid visa before they take my visa and they deport me back to the United States. So it was a one-to-one -one relationship. I have six months left to legally be in Finland and I have six months left of school, which means I had one shot to, to finish and graduate. If I had failed a single class, I wouldn't have time to stay and retake it. My visa would have been taken. And she always told me that I'm not gonna file it until, you know, until you finish school, I'm not like that, but I didn't believe it. I, in my head, you know, you've done enough other things to where I don't, I don't believe it anymore. If I had failed one thing, basically I would have been getting deported back to the United States, which is so funny to think about, deported back to the United States. You don't hear that phrase a whole lot. And banned from the EU, all of Europe for, for 10 years. And the thought of restarting school at 24 years old, back again in the United States and picking up where I left off after I had just basically completed a degree was just a, was just a no-go. The degree transfers, but the, the classes don't because the titles don't line up. Like Calculus 3 isn't called Calculus 3 in Finland. So that was a really big moment for me, realizing that like I have one shot at this and I am completely responsible for myself. None of my family showed up to my wedding. I know we got married in a courthouse and then we also got married in an actual church, right? So I was standing up at the altar and on her side of the church is, you know, her family. And then on my side of the church is just empty pews. That was a really weird experience. None of them showed up to my actual graduation for the for the degree. None of them actually even visited me in Finland while I was there. So at that point, it was pretty much do or die. And I studied like a madman. I explained the situation to my teachers and basically I just worked my ass off. I had to pass every single class. I had to pass classes 
that I failed. I had to write a thesis. In Finland, you have to write like a 60 page thesis. And then I started applying to basically every single job that I could. During the marriage, I had blown up to about 240 pounds. You know, shield your eyes. I was a big boy back then. You know, I had that marriage weight. So one day I took a good look at myself in the mirror. I didn't have a shirt on and I was like, you're gonna be back on the market here soon, Josh. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to touch this. So you better, you better get in shape here. Then I remember as I started to go to the gym a lot, my collarbones started to show. And that's really weird to think about. You're, how do you not see collarbones? That was a big boy. <laughs> and, and she would guilt trip me and say, your collarbones are starting to show. You're getting too skinny. That's not healthy. And I was still like not skinny it was it was just a, a lot of projections of insecurity i guess but i started to line up some interviews before i graduated school and um, i started to get to the final phases phases of all this stuff and i had about three weeks left i found a company here in utah that i got to the final stage with and um, i didn't tell her any of these places that i was applying to or interviewing to because I did once and she's like that's a stupid company they'll never hire you so then finally towards the end of things like she was living with me again where I would go to my friend's house just because it wasn't healthy for us to be in the same place anymore and uh, the company that I was applying to here in Utah that I got my first job at had called but I didn't answer they couldn't reach a finished phone number so they left a voicemail on my Skype and this was supposedly the final step of the interview that I had been waiting for because I literally had no plan to I had nothing to go back to in the United States if I was going to get deported anyways my parents had just been sued and lost their house and they were homeless and so like I was really trying to figure out something I was frantically trying to call them back I called and it just went to voicemail every single time I thought I had missed the opportunity to accept the offer because I didn't know anything about jobs then and I was just losing my mind like oh no this was my chance to hear and I lost I didn't I was like well I'll just listen to the voicemail and the guy <laughs> was like hey I couldn't reach your phone number listed here for some reason but I'd just like to congratulate you uh, uh, on getting a, an offer here as a mechanical engineer, and uh, I'd like to read your verbal offer letter to you. And I'm like, and I remember I dropped the phone, and I just ran over to my friend, and I just gave him a big hug. And he was like, do what? Because he's Finnish, right? And Finnish people, they don't touch. They're not very touchy-feely people. And I just gave him the biggest hug in the world. He's like, dude. And I'm like, I did it, man. And he was like, you did it, man. And then he hugged me back. I never forget that bro moment, dude. Never forget that bro moment. Thanks for listening to me complaining those few years, you know, because he was like the only guy that would actually be like, dude, man, that sucks. And I appreciate you for hearing me out because you were the only one that actually did. So I accepted the job offer. I sent in a bunch of paperwork and got everything going, you know, but I didn't have any money or anything like that. Um, her mom gave me like 300 euros. Very, very last day I said goodbye to everybody and she drove me to the airport. I remember she like tried to give me a kiss on the lips and said like, I will always love you. And I like turned my head so that she couldn't do it because I was like, no, 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 not after this, you know, like this isn't too much. Like, I don't know what you were planning if I didn't find a job and like, n n no. And like, uh, I just, yeah, I said, okay, bye. Went up the escalator to the airport and I kind of like turned around and I looked through the glass and she was kind of just like hysterically crying again but I had been through so many phases of this hysterical crying that it didn't it didn't mean much to me you know it's the last time I ever saw her it's the last time I've ever been to Finland really uh, a 36 hour plane ride later I got to Utah I showed up at the airport I got my little rental car they let me have and that was it and then we started a new air been here ever since questions you might be wondering um, did you have any kids no no, we didn't have any kids. Uh, to this day, even, I, I don't actually have the divorce paper. I have a marriage certificate uh, that I took here that I thought I might need at some point, but I'm pretty sure that's not valid anymore. Um, but I've actually never seen the divorce certificate. I just assumed that she filed the paper, but I never got married. I never registered as married here in the United States anyways. Will I ever get married again? No, never again. I don't get anything out of it. It's too much risk involved for me. Well, what about if you want to have kids, Josh? Well, I don't want to have kids. There's a there's a lot of kids out there already without loving parents that I think if I wanted to have kids, I would I would go adopt a kid or just go be, you know, go go do like the big brother thing and just try and mentor some kids that, that don't really have families or maybe foster some kids. So I guess that's it. That's the story about how I got a degree in Finland while being married and then getting divorced and almost deported. And I would like to go back to Finland and visit now that I actually have some money. 
I would I would say it was like almost like an, an emotionally abusive relationship. Um, and as a, as a man, you're told a lot to just kind of man up and, and deal with things and just kind of suck it up. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think those last few moments when I was really kind of getting it into gear, kind of really let me know what I could do, like let me know what I was really capable of, right? It went from 240 pounds down to like 180 pounds, got really skinny, and then I started to bulk up again, and like I went from having flaps to having abs, and um, just really pushing myself to the limit of what I could do with, with kind of like no one else's help. I think that's kind of a big part of what made me who I am today. So I guess that's it. Thanks for listening to my story, and uh, I hope you guys have a good Thursday. I'll see you in the next one.